This is a production of Cornell University. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little bit. This is the, the structure. I'll give you a little bit of background. Talk about farmscape ecology, the two-way. What, what do farms provide for nature? What does nature provide for farms? Uh, connecting people to the ecology of their landscape, understanding the people side, and then very briefly outline a study that we're thinking of trying to do. Um, so this is who we are. And I'm sorry, this is because everybody's this is, I guess, a bit low for people, but this is, uh, we work at Hawthorne Valley Farm, which is in Columbia County, which is the New York County, which is on ba basically the border with Massachusetts. And it's uh, a biodynamic farm, about two hours north of New York City. This is our regular staff. You know, here's the, here's the center of the operations, and then the rest of us kind of come along for the ride. Um, but just to give you a little bit idea who we are so that you can understand what we can or can't do, uh, my wife is a, a botanist, a plant ecologist. Uh, Anna is actually an anthropologist, so she works with us with the people part of things. Kyle, who's here but in the, in the insect collection today, uh, is our technician, but he's been working a lot with ants and the patterns in the landscape. Uh, our son is the, really into dragonflies, so he's a lot faster, has a lot better eyes than I do. Uh, our dog is always with us. And then <laughs> I tend to shuffle papers. Um, but if I can, which makes me more happy, I'm, I'm actually a wildlife ecologist, as Emily said. So just a little bit of background, Hawthorne Valley Farm. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about what biodynamic farming is, partially because I'm not all that experienced in it. But in terms of why it's relevant or works with us, a form of organic farming that views the farm as an individuality, closely tied to its social and ecological surroundings, and ideally largely self-sufficient in terms of its nutrient flows. So it is, part of that philosophy is what I'd say ecological, and so we fit into that. Um, they tend to be diverse, they tend to connect with the community, so the work, a lot of our work is connecting with the community, the people in the area, which fits into this philosophy. So what we do as a program, the Farmscape Ecology Program, is try to encourage informed compassion for our local working landscape, its people, and other life. And we work with research and we work with outreach to try to do that. And it's really trying to get enthusiasm, trying to help people be curious about their landscape and help inform them at the same time. Uh, we do try to do original research, but we're not in an academic setting. So our audience is not really our scientific peers, but it's the people in the county, the farmers we interact with, the general public. So that affects uh, you know, how we do our work, for better or worse. Um, so getting into sort of the heart of what we try to do, farmscape ecology, I think we try to think about it in two ways. We try to think about what can farming potentially provide to nature conservation in our landscape. I'm not talking, I, I don't know the global situation. And then also the reverse, what can farm, what can nature potentially do for farming? Does that make sense? So far? Um, so you tend to have, look at, there's a, a tendency to look at a landscape like this either as being production, the pasture, the, the gardens, the pasture, etc., or from the perspective of nature conservation, but of course it's really a combined landscape, and that's what we try to emphasize both in our research and as we interact with people. How does that all go together? Um, one of the things that we've found helpful in trying to communicate with farmers and other people about what can farming provide to nature is an idea that builds on this. And so this is what Hawthorne Valley could be any place really, look like say for, in the year 1400. You know, lots of forest, there might have been some native agriculture, there were probably a lot more beaver. Uh, this hillside probably burned, you know, not every year, but regularly. May have looked something like that. And you had certain organisms existing in that landscape. And then that landscape evolved over time. And you had, this is maybe what it looked like in 1870, same landscape, this is the same section, um, but based on aerial photographs and other historical evidence, this is sort of what it looked like in its most open state. And then today, now that, and that would be what the landscape looked like. And then today, I'm jumping ahead, you had various organisms existing in there, and then today it looks more like this. 
And so the question becomes, this is today's landscape. You've got more roads. Forest has come back. You have, still have some fields. And our question is, OK, those native organisms that existed in this landscape, or perhaps in this landscape, where do they find space in today's landscape? And the way that we try to, to think of that are through analogies. Now, I imagine this is probably actually a simile, but I'll say it's an analogy. But anyway, we try to think of ecological analogies. And what we mean by an ecological analogy is a, it refers to a human-shaped habitat, which, while not the ones that the given organism co-evolved with, offer enough similarities or analogies to be ecologically functional for that species. So an example is, you know, this is what it look. This is what a forest looks like after it has burned. You have this shru this brush coming up. Well, this is a lightly grazed pasture that also has a lot of brush in it. It's not the same thing, and I won't, I'm not trying to claim it is. But there are certain species that occurred here, for which this analogy works. This is another example. This is a beaver pond, and this is a cow pond. Again, they're not the same thing. And there's certainly things in here that are not in here. But, for example, some of the dragonflies that like these edges that are like that, they'll be there and they'll be here. So we say this works as an analogy just for that, those species of dragonflies for this. And so to answer, come back to that question, where do they find a home, they, the answer is, well, where they find workable analogies. And so what our challenge is, you know, how can farming encourage such analogies? Does that make sense, more or less? So a lot of what we do is try to work with farmers to help them understand the history and the ecology of their landscape from the perspective of understanding those, that story and those analogies. And this is just, this is some work we did for Roxbury Farm. How many of you know Roxbury Farm? I think you could be at a seminar today where you actually hear Jean-Paul from Roxbury talking, but if you came here, you're not going to hear him. But um, we do ecological maps, and then we try to think of each of these habitats, and we try to imagine, you know, what could they, what might the analogies be, and how could those be encouraged? This is the same. It was a big farm. This is another map. This is Hawthorne Valley, the same idea, um, a, a habitat map for a farm. And then don't worry about the small print, but this is the type of information that we would give them. We'd have that habitat map. And then for each of that ha those habitats, we talk about location, nature conservation value, how it might interact with agricultural production, and suggestions for management. But we're not prescriptive. I mean, the farmers know a lot better than we know how that land should be farmed. So these are just ideas. It's just sort of we're sharing our ideas for better or worse. Is this camera on? Because I keep feeling like I must be getting my ear filmed or something as I'm standing here. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry about don't it. Don't worry about it. OK. Uh, so I'm just going to run through some of these habitats so that you get a little bit of an idea of how we're thinking about this. You know, so mature hay fields, were the ecological analogies? Who are the species of conservation interest? Well, for some species, the analogy might be between prairies and hay fields. Now, this works as a structural analogy for these grassland nesting birds. I mean, I think they're fairly, that's a fairly common example that's brought up. Um, and in our county, you know, this is, this is the trajectory of open area in our county. So those, those birds have certainly gone through a real decline in, in habitat availability since the 1880s, but there was not all that much to start with. Um, one of the things that you bring into the question when you're thinking about those specific what makes that work as a habitat for grassland birds is, well, when does haying happen relative to when the, the young birds get out of the nest? So if you're haying it before the birds are out of the nest, then it doesn't work as an analogy. Does that make sense? Um, and this is just a, some historical work we did looking at date of haying today. That's the black space behind this versus various historical data we have from the county. And the point is, Haying is occurring much, is occurring earlier in general than it occurred historically, which makes that analogy less viable for some of the grassland birds because they fledge sort of in here. So if most of the haying, for example, the shakers were doing most of their haying after the middle of June, um, beginning of July, whereas today a lot of it's happening before that, and that makes it more difficult for those birds to get their, their young off. 
It doesn't work, and this is important when you think about analogies, it's not, it's, you're not reconstructing prairie. It, that analogy doesn't work for butterflies. And the reason it doesn't work for butterflies is they're much more botanically picky. The caterpillars of butterflies need to find, like a monarch, you know, goes out after the milkweed. They have to find the particular plants they're looking for, which aren't going to be in a hayfield. So it doesn't work. That same analogy doesn't work so well for butterflies. Uh, old fields and poor meadows. This is another habitat you find on farms. Maybe the analogy is we do have grasslands in our area that are hilltop, rocky grasslands, some native grasses up here. There were organisms historically that survived there. Maybe some of those actually come down into these old fields. <clears throat> this is some work that my wife did looking at the botanical diversity of pastures, hay fields, well, intensive pastures, drier hill pastures, showing that you know, a great proportion, there are more species in these dry hill hillsides, plus more of them are native. So as a sort of a place where you're going to have conservation of native plant species, these dry hillsides are quite interesting. In part, perhaps, because there were sources in the landscape that had species already adapted to those kinds of environments. And the great thing is it does work. I like butterflies, so you've got to bear with me. It does work for these butterflies um, because you do have those native plants there. Their caterpillars can feed on them. So the analogy works for them. Shrubby fields. I talked, <coughs> this, this slide should still be familiar. Uh, this is the one with the, the burn over and the, the, the post-cow shrubland. That's one of the analogies you might have. Who do you find there? Well, how, how many of you know the Eastern Cotton, the, sorry, the New England Cottontail? Have you heard about that? The New England Cottontail is actually being considered for endangered species status. It's Silvalagus, so it's the same species as the Eastern Cottontail, but it's one that has essentially used to be the only cottontail east of the Hudson, a shrubland species. It's declined dramatically, and one of the areas is, are these shrublands. So that's one of the species you could potentially find in such an area. Shrubland birds uh, are also important, and many of them have been declining dramatically. So I'm just giving you a quick kind of rundown. Don't worry about the details, but just giving you a little bit of an overview for what some of these different habitats might offer, potentially can offer. Um, one of the other habitats that we've been looking at is the old farm woodlot and its role as being actually ancient farm, as ancient forest. And when I talk about ancient, I mean forest that has long been in forest, although extensive logging or other uses may have occurred. So the idea is a primary forest is obviously one that's sort of basically never been, almost never been touched, right? Whereas an ancient forest, the idea is it's been in forest for a long time, although many of those trees may not be particularly old. Does that make sense? So primary forest is ancient, but not all ancient forests are primary. Um, and the interesting thing, when you look at the, his the history of the landscape, so this is the 1940s. That's the earliest aerial photographs we have for our region. You see lots of farmland, but you see some of these areas that were left in forest, partially because they're rocky, but partially because all farms needed a wood lot for building barns, for wood, for that sort of thing. Now today, yeah, it just all looks like the same thing. However, Forests like this have some special things because they were never taken out of forest. Well, you know, never in the past 10,000 years. This is just an example. We were working in a farmland setting. This is another habitat map. And these dark areas here are plots that we've realized were probably some of these ancient forests. Uh, one of the ways we did that, we were doing soil samples. And so we were looking at the depth of the organic layer. Because when you plow something, that gets all mixed up and you can't, you don't have that deep organic layer. So we can use soils to help us find which areas are ancient forest. And when you go into an ancient forest like this, you find a variety of old trees, old sh you know, shrubs. It's, now, none of these are particularly big trees because logging has occurred. But the soil conditions are such that you get something like rattlesnake plantain. Does anybody know rattlesnake plantain here? Ah, great. <laughs> Pardon? I think that sounds right. My wife's the botanist, so I'll take your word for it. But um, that could well be. That's, it's, a, it's an orchid. We almost never saw it. And then all of a sudden, we were walking through these old forests, these ancient forest 
plots. And there it was. So there's some special things going on in there. Um, we did some studies with floodplain forests. These are the forests along creeks. And we looked at ancient versus not ancient forests. And what you find, we categorized those forests into different forest types. And then in this case, we were comparing cover by invasive shrubs. And we found that, you know, indeed, the more recent forests, not surprising, are the ones that had the highest amount of invasive shrubs in them. Whereas the, the older ones, they hadn't, one of the interesting things to think about is, you picture, can, when I say shrub, when I say floodplain forest, can you picture this? It's the areas along the streams that regularly, maybe once or twice a year, get flooded. They're really disturbed areas. And if all that forest is taken off, then you have this great inoculation of invasive species coming down the creek and going in and being able to set up there. So if in the past 50 years you cleaned it out completely, then you have this big inoculation. If that's been in forest, then those, those invasive species are much less able to establish themselves. Um, and basically, you also see a higher diversity of native species. I won't go into that too much. Uh, you have meadows and ponds. So that was a, a, a wet meadow on a farm. This is a p farm pond. Analogy, as we mentioned before, might be a beaver pond. And one of the interesting things to think about is that you know, beaver have this huge impact on the ecology of our landscape. And there were a lot of beaver, like in the 1500s. And this is, what this is is an estimate of the amount of pond surface area in Columbia County versus year. And what you see is that there was probably a huge drop off in the amount of pond because the beaver were all trapped out for fur around 1600, 1700. Then you started to get mill ponds. And now, just now, with all this, um, I don't know if you have it here or not, do you have a sort of a fashion for ponds in this area, new houses? Yeah, OK. So that's, that's sort of what, what this accounts for. But the thing is, they're not the same ecologically. Uh, and so we did some work with, with ponds, both on farms and off ponds, off ponds, off farms. So what, this is an index. We looked at plants. We looked at various animals. So this is just an index of overall diversity. This is the surrounding land use, agricultural, residential, mixed, or neither. And this was about 95 ponds that we looked at. And what you see is that the, the agricultural ponds actually were more diverse than the residential ponds, which you might, if you think about the typical residential pond, you know you might understand this, because most of them, or many of them, are mowed around, people want to keep them crystal clear, and that's not what life wants to do. <laughs> and some of these, now these aren't loafing ponds in the middle of a farmyard, but these are, might be ponds in grazed areas. These are much more loosely managed, and so they're more diverse. Make sense? Another analogy might be vernal pools. And we actually do find some of these vernal pool amphibians in those farm ponds that don't have a lot of fish in them. Wet meadows, again, are quite diverse areas, have quite a few native species, um, a place that probably, again, probably a lot of native species, relatively speaking, because they were part of the natural landscape. And these are just some pretty flowers. That you, these are wet meadow flowers. Some of our, this is a beautiful flower, if you know this, cardinal flower. And, sorry, got <laughs> to bring in some butterflies. One of my favorite butterflies, the bronze copper. And Baltimore checker spot with its food plant, turtle head. OK, what does nature provide to farming? Um, I think there's some of you who know much more about this than I do. Uh, but we have started to try to look at it, in part because as we were working with farmers, you know, that's, a, that's a very much a question that's a, uh, important to them. Yes, they're interested in ecology. But of course, what can it do for them in production-wise? And it's not an either or, but it's how do you also respect their perspective and, and help them try to understand this aspect. Does anybody have questions about that part that I just went through? Okay. Some of you are actually still awake, so that's good. <laughs> um, okay, ecological services. So I sort of, I always feel a little bit hesitant saying services because it's kind of like saying that my wife gives me marital services <laughs> or something like that, which, or that I give her husband services um, in the sense that I think there's a, you know, there's more to it than just the, just the nitty-gritty of the 
the monetary effects, but it's one way of looking at it. And of course, bees are one of the very often talked about uh, providers of, of some of these ecological services. This was some work we did, actually a student working with us, very basic stuff. You know, what are the different kinds of insects that come and fertilize on some of the crop plants? Well, you know, yes, honeybee, but maybe it's only about a quarter. And these other ones, many of these are native species that are providing those pollination services. And this was, again, that, that generality, this was looking at different crops and percent of number of native bee visits um, for some crops like cucumbers, mainly honeybees were pollinating those. But then for some other ones, like the wild, the, well, the wildflowers would make sense, but maybe like uh, broccoli rab or up here, the raspberries, they were getting more pollinated by the wild bees. And this builds into our consideration of landscape because of something like this. Now, this is not our work. This is from uh, Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State University looking at bees that pollinate blueberries. But basically, this is the blueberry flowering period. And these are the flight periods of the different pollinators. And so the question that this poses is, OK, great. You provide them with a blueberry crop. But how are they staying alive the rest of the year? You know, you've got to provide something for them out here if you want to have those native species around pollinating your crops. Right? Makes sense? Uh, so we did a little bit related to that. We, going back to that floodplain study I showed you, have any of you been in a floodplain early in the spring, say in May? What do you see? Wildflowers, yeah. Do you know like uh, bloodroot? Have you seen bloodroot? Uh, what's some other one? Um, trout lily, yeah, definitely trout lily. Blue cohosh, maybe some. So it's before the trees leaf out, you have this big burst of flowers. So it's a great place for bees. And what we looked at was the bees on a farm and an adjacent floodplain. And what we found was that you know, about a quarter of those species here were ones we found in the spring on the floodplain and then later in the year in the farm fields. So it just starts to give you this picture of how the landscape is supporting what's happening in those crop fields, some of those services. Um, this is just you know, another way of looking at some of these, the amount of flowers around a vegetable garden and the amount of bees we see. And not surprisingly, more flowers, more bees, except I didn't show you this one. <laughs> this is the one that screws up the statistics. Uh, this observation up here. But what was interesting was when we went back and looked at that, that was the farm. These, these are 19 different farms in the county. This farm was the sandiest farm. So how does that explain the result? Ground nesting bees, yeah. So you have bees really like to be able to, some of these um, individual bees nest in sandy areas. So when you have sandy soil, it's just a much better habitat for them. So it adds, yes, flowers and food sources are important. But as, every, as is well recognized, um, nesting sources are too. We've looked at spiders. These are just how many of you, have you ever seen jumping spiders? They're really, they're fun spiders because they're the spiders that look at you. So you hold them in your hand and they follow you around. And so they're really fun. Um, there is an orb weaver. You probably know these ones, the big argiopes that you see in there. And a crab spider waiting for somebody, some unfortunate. I didn't look up, I forgot the family. This might be an amarubid. But anyway, we did a study. This, this is our tropical fish slide, which has no, no. This is the, this is actually an aerial view of Hawthorne Valley Farm main gardens. And so this is where the crops are. This is a little bit of a historical picture now because they've changed the arrangement of the farm and not so much of this is in crop. But this is crop. And then these are surrounding. This is pasture. This is a riparian area. This is, these are wetlands here. And what we did was we just followed the insects both in the center part of the farm and also in the surroundings, or insects and spiders. Um, a little bit, this was an initial work, just to try to understand how does that change? What is the flow of these invertebrates over the year? And the example here I'm going to show you is spiders. Um, the white areas, we just didn't, we couldn't study all of these. We didn't have the person power. But the darker the green, the more abundant were the spiders. And so we're just going to go through the year. This is May. That's July, June, July, July, September, and then September, October. And the, the pattern 
I think, which is sort of summarized here, is that early in the year, sort of the wilder areas and the drive strips, which are the uncultivated areas, they tended to have the most spiders, whereas by the end of the year, the crops and the crop edges had the most spiders. So you can picture, we have to know this better, and this is a, a little bit of just a just so story, but you can picture that there's a flow going on here, perhaps the, the spiders earlier in the year coming into these more central crop areas. You know, wasps are another important provider. This is the, this is the tomato hornworm, well, well parasitized. Do you know what, what the, the wasps do to tomato hornworm? Have you seen that? So they, they're actually a control of the tomato hornworm, by, not this wasp in particular, but another much smaller wasp. Um, and this was just you know, the relationship between the amount of forest at each of these 19 different farms and the amount of, in this case, wingless wasps that we found in our trapping. And there is a significant relationship. The more the forest you have, the more of these wingless wasps you have. Again, very gross information. You'd have to look at it in more detail, but suggestive of a relationship between the landscape and the uh, amount of these beneficials. This is my other family. So, <laughs> uh, I, this is, I, when I have a chance to work with insects, this is what I work with a lot, the ground beetles, the crabids. Um, an interesting group, some of which are, I have to confess, some are pests, but many of them, hopefully the majority of them, are actually beneficial. We, they can be both pest predators and weed seed predators. Uh, and we just started to look at the, the patterns. How are, these, how are these communities of beetles distributed on the landscape? This was a study we did. We basically, we looked at the beetles that we found in the crops. In this case, we were just looking at tomato in the surrounding grassy areas and then, then in the forest and just asked the question, how are these communities related? You know, is this, if you look at veggies, grassland and woods, is it all essentially one beetle community? Or is it something like this, where they're each completely distinct beetle communities? And of course, as most ecological answers are, the answer is sort of, or kind of, or somewhat. Uh, but basically we ended up with, with data like this. These are different ground beetle species, you know, the amount, the percentage of captures in the cultivated, the edge areas in the wilder sections. Some of them are basically only in the cultivated areas, but some of them spread out more widely. And, it, and to, you know, go further with this, you'd have to understand, you know, which of these are really most important in terms of those agroecological services. But again, it's just trying to look at the, the patterns of life on the landscape relative to the services they might provide. Okay, so far? Um, we wanted to ask, okay, which, if we look at these three areas, we look at the veggies, we look at the woods, we look at the surrounding grassland, what are the, what are the ones that are most related to each other? And we just looked at correlations, you know, how, how closely correlated is the abundance of ants, spiders, and ground beetles in veggies versus ants, spiders, and ground beetles in woodlands? You know, what's, and basically what's this, so is the higher the value, the more closely correlated the, the two communities were. So grass and wood, yeah, you know, more than a third of the cases were significantly um, correlated, more than a third of the different uh, insect groups we looked at, whereas woods and veggies were not so closely correlated. And so diagrammatically, the, that's represented by woods and grassland, quite similar in community or relatively grassland and veggie, yeah, somewhat veggie and woodland, not quite so much. You don't need to see that. <laughs> it was fine. This I just put up there in case our technician came. We're also looking at ants, and uh, Kyle, the technician I showed you, has been looking at ants, and this is the same sort of thing, but for different ant species. If you're into ants, I can show you that slide in more detail later. Um, we'd love to understand, this is some of the work that Emily did, well, not this in particular, but th this whole theme of soils. Again, how, have, how has the landscape changed? How has soil life changed, and how does that affect what can happen today on the landscape. This is some historical data on organic matter in cropland, hay, pasture, and forest in New York State. I couldn't find something specifically for our county. This is from our county. It may or may not be a completely valid comparison, um, but the forest value is, you know, around seven. But what's interesting is, you know, the amount of organic matter here versus apparently how much it has decreased over that time. What effect has that had on soil life? 
you know, this is, this is the answer. I don't know what the answer is. This was one of our attempt to look at it, and it's just like all over the board. I won't even try to explain that. Um, <laughs> Emily did some work on the Hawthorne Valley Farm where she looked at far, uh, fields that had been in haying, pasture, and veggies over quite a few, at least 10 years. And we had actually individual data on how much was coming in and out of those fields. What effect did that have on the soils? We did grow outs. You can talk to Emily about that. It was a somewhat, it was a somewhat messy picture. Uh, although, interestingly, when you grew soils, when you grew plants in these soils, it seems like the actual the height of the plant did correspond to what you'd predict very roughly from our budgets of nutrients in and out. Um, Emily is nodding reassuringly that I'm not talking complete nonsense when I'm up here. Uh, another thing to look at at ecological services that people don't always think about is, you know, these are some of the pastures at Hawthorne Valley. And if you're a grazier, you'll look at this and you say, oh my God, you know, they're grazing on that? These things, these aren't sheep, they're cows. Um, but one thing that people have started to look at is actually the role of, I'll, let me just go back. I'll just use this. The role of fields like this in self-medication. So actually cows have been shown to self-medicate to a certain degree. And that means they go out and they find different plants in their landscape that might help them if they've got a high parasite load. What is this important? Does it have a milk effect? We don't know yet. Uh, but that might be another sort of a service that the botanical diversity is providing to, to cow health. Um, I'll go over that. I want to get to butterflies again? Uh, just a, a you know, there's obviously how these different habitats are arranged around the farm, but there's also what you do on the farm. This is a wildflower strip. Um, and this farm happened to be surrounded by wetland. So we got this amazing diversity of wet, actually fairly rare wetland butterflies coming in and nectaring here. And this was a nice combination of how this farm was actually interacting with its landscape. Um, OK. Going on to a little bit other aspects of our program. You know, we do work with farmers, but we work a lot with the general public. And you've got a picture. Columbia County is two hours north of New York City. And that means. You know, we have a lot of second homes. In some towns, more than a third of the homes are second homes. What is it here? Does anybody know? What per proportion of homes are second homes? Anybody got an idea? I don't know. But anyway, about a third are second homes. We have people coming up on weekends, things like that. And so you have people coming in. They're often coming in with ideas about how they want to manage the landscape. And part of our program is how do you sort of help them you know, slow down? and look at where they are without telling them this is bad, this is good, but just how do you help them realize a bit better where they are in the landscape? And this is a little picture I put together a long time ago, but I still like it. And it actually came out of talking to somebody who was a postdoc over in Natural Resources, who was a designer of parks. And he said, look, if you're going to have a park and you want people to come, you design it so that the greatest diversity of people come to that. You might have art, you might have history, you might have ecology. And so this is what I call the park of local knowledge and caring. And of course, it doesn't exist as a physical park. But the idea is, if you want people to connect to their landscape, how can you bring them into it? Well, some people get connected with food. Some love history. Some love nature appreciation. Some want to go through formal schooling. Like, oh. um, Some love technology. So maybe you have to do a Facebook page. Um, but the idea is, as we try to connect people to the landscape, how can we diversify these different ways that they can enter that landscape? And you know, this is one. This was our attempt at ecotourism. Join the craze. Can can <laughs> this was a really one that took a bit of explaining to farmers. This was our pond study. You know, so why exactly do you want to go out in the middle of my mucky cow pond with a canoe? Uh, we were doing sediment cores. But anyway, we've had nobody take us up on this offer yet. <laughs> uh, we try to look at, you know, communicate the idea of history. Because people like to be part of a story. And this was a, one thing that really hit us that we hadn't been expecting. We went in and we gave this ecological talk. And we gave this little bit at the beginning about history. We got done with the talk. And nobody asked ecological questions. They were all fascinated with the history part. And so what we want to try to do is we don't want to forget about the ecological part, but help people understand where they are. You're here. You, know, you could sort of say a big sign. You're here. This is where history is at now. History is going to keep running. What's happened in the past and how does that affect where we may be going? This is, actually happens to be different animals in Columbia County. Um, this was the sheep boom. If any of you have looked at agricultural history, it was a big, <coughs> and there's some you know, really high-class espionage associated with that. There was actually the Merino sheep, the Spanish sheep, 
were a very important, very valued part of the European uh, wool production, and there were these, all these covert actions to, to get sheep out of Europe. Um, this ha and this is your goal. You want to have one of these in your, your stall. Um, and so anyway, this is just agricultural history in Columbia County over the years, the different types of production. And I, if anybody's interested in ag history, I can go into it. But I'm just trying to give you the feel for what we communicate to people to help them feel like they're part of, of something. But we also want to help them, you know, yes, we're interested in ecology. Yes, we're interested in agriculture. But how might that translate into the communities that they're living in, even if they're not farmers? And so this is the, um, the percentage of the Columbia County workforce in agriculture, service and retail, and manufacturing over about 200 years. So it gives people, you know, we're here right now. We've got a huge service retail component, very little in agriculture, very little in manufacturing. I'm not saying you want to go back here, but it shows you what has happened on the land and what might conceivably be possible. And we do want to talk about land cover. This is the amount of forest over time, the amount of farmland, the amount of shrubland. Again, just trying to say, OK, here's the history, and then how does that translate into the ecology? And we work you know, in terms of how we get out and work with people. These are just some of the ways, some of the people we've worked with. We have interns. We've got people who are part of a natural history participatory research group. Um, this is a rice farmer from up in Vermont who just really loves dragonflies, who comes down and spends a couple of days with us each year. Um, so just how we reach out to people. We work with some of the regional conservation organizations, many of whom have farmland. And so we help them with management plans. Um, this is a really neat, if any of you are into shakers, this is a really fascinating story of ecology and culture uh, in New Lebanon, which I could go into more if people were interested. Um, and we appear at various events and we do nature walks and uh, we want to make sure we did do some work with students. So we get them out there on the coldest, rainiest days. And really what it makes you feel is it makes you feel old. So, you know, there I am out there bundled up and there was somebody in a t-shirt and shorts, a teenager. Here. You know, obviously there's some me metabolic change has happened here. That, uh, but anyway, and we try to go, try to go online. This is our blog. It's our Facebook page. This is our soon to be launched redesigned web page. But the point is that trying to think of, var again, it's that park idea. You know, I'm not into Facebook. I never did Facebook until I had that thing there. But people told us, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of younger people do have Facebook pages. That's a group of people we haven't connected with well. So we have a Facebook page. And it's fun. I mean, I, I do enjoy it. This is one of our main projects right now, the Living Land Project. The goal of this is we're putting together a field guide to the culture and ecology of our landscape. So we've been doing, this happens to be Columbia County, where you see it, this is the outline. We divvied it up into different ecological regions, and then we're trying to look at the habitats in each of these regions. And we're going to try to put a together a field guide. So if you're a landowner, you can go out and say, okay, what sort of forest do I have in my backyard? At the same time, we also want to look at the, the cultural aspect. So the question becomes, okay, you have this kind of forest in your backyard. How do your neighbors perceive that forest? How might a farmer think of that forest? And we're not trying to say, you know, that's the right perception, that's the wrong perception. It's not that. It's just how, does, how do the people around you perceive of that landscape? And can we use this approach to help people understand, you know, not only where they are culturally, but also uh, ecologically? And you get to have pretty, got another butterfly. Um, this is a big spring salamander, a beautiful orange bright salamander like that that my hadn't, we hadn't found in the county. My son said, what's this? And that's what it was. Um, finding more orchids around. And, you know, these sort of pictures are important because, again, who are we communicating with? We're communicating with people who are going to, you know, who like the pictures. They're going to be more interested in the pictures than in a graph, for example. We want to have the graphs to back up our ideas but this is how we're going to reach people, is through their heart. And then a, just a little bit uh, about what Anna's work has been. Some of it already has to do with connecting people to the, the landscape. Uh, but Anna has done a lot of fun work looking at the food system in the county. And again, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I can give you links. It's on our website. I can connect you with Anna. She did a whole project on the Columbia County food system, because farmers were farmers that asked us, you know, what, how does this work? economically. And so she did, again, 
you're not expected to read the small print unless you want to come up and try to read it. But you know, CSAs, how do they relate to the, the different, we have CSAs in the city, we have CSAs up in the county. How do the perceptions that people have and what they want to get out of it differ based on where they're from? Um, farmer's market, what, is the, uh, what are the prices? What do people want to get from their farmer's market? Anyway, that kind of a study that helps us understand how people are using the landscape. This was a fun project she did on new farmers. I imagine it's the same here. You probably got quite a few new farmers, new farms coming up. Is that, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and in Columbia County, that's also the case. And so she, she interviewed many of these farmers, uh, put together profiles of each of the different farms, and put together, this is a map of, again, Columbia County. You're going to get familiar with this shape. Um, and these are the different new farms there. And Partially, again, it, gets a, it gives us an idea of how people are, are using the, the ecology of people on this landscape, I guess you could say. And she also asked some more specific questions about their relationships to the land. So as we try to communicate some of those like ecological maps I was showing you earlier, well, yeah, we can stand up here and tell, tell or share what we feel is important, but we also need to understand what the people, what they feel is important. So trying to understand their perspectives on the landscape can help us share ours more, and also help us design our research so it's most useful for them. And this is a, the part of the Living Land Project. It's what we call the Special Places um, Display. And it's basically, this is, <laughs> there it is again, Columbia County. Um, it's a big board where you get to come up to it, like a, if you're at a farmer's market, you come up to it. And if you want to, you can put where are your special places on this map. And you know, where do you go to hunt? Where do you go to look for nice views, where do you go when you want to go swimming or whatever. Of course, some of this is secret and people don't want to share. Um, but the idea is you come out with a map like this that starts to show you sort of the, topo the cultural topography of your landscape. What are the places that are really neat to people? And how, again, do you build that interest into helping them connect with their landscape, maybe spreading that interest out, but also honoring the places that they want to visit or, or feel that are important. Um, so what have we learned? This is the, this is the hardest slide to make. Uh, it's probably the most boring one to look at, too. Uh, but basically, these are just so, sort of the generalities that I would say we've been at this for about 10 years. You know, ecologically, um, I, I think it still cont continues to surprise me how much land use history has an effect on what we're seeing today. It's not, that's not something new, but it, again, it's just what personally have we learned. And then the fine scale patterns of the unseen world. I, there's just to go out into these some forests and go, like Kyle, who's the ant biologist. So he's found an ant that's common in Columbia County, and the only other place it's known is Iowa and Ohio. <coughs> so why? Why is it not known from New England? I have no idea. We have no idea. But it's these sort of mysteries and patterns that you realize there's a lot going out there, and they're responding to aspects of the habitat that we don't see or understand. Uh, agroecology. So I, I, I mean, I do believe that agriculture has the potential. I'm not saying it's automatic to create important nature, cons nature conservation benefits through those analogies we talked about. The ebb and flow of farm relevant life and the importance of understanding community status. So this is, the, this is those, those agricultural um, services that I'm talking about and understanding where are these creatures coming from? What's affecting how far they travel? What's affecting the habitats they need for overwintering or what have you? Sort of those commuting strategies relative to the agroecological services. And then you know, can we associate biodiversity actually with benefits in production? And that's a big if. Um, but, it, but it's sort of the core of, of, of really making this relevant for the farmers. Um, sociologically, you know, one of the fun, the fun things, I had not worked with farmers before, going out and interacting with farmers, you know, a lot of them are really just keyed. If you didn't come in in a situation where, you know, you're doing this wrong, uh, this, this creek is all dirty, you shouldn't be doing this, but more, you know, let me just show you what's in your creek. Great, you know, I, my kids play in the creek. I sometimes wade in the creek. I, I love to know more about the nature. And, and so a lot of the farmers were really interested in that, although they might not have the time to do much about it. Uh, people like to be part of a story. I talked about that. Um, it's hard to find a substitute for person to, to for into individual interactions. You know, you can put together, and this is what funding agencies want you to do. They want you to put together pamphlets to give to farmers to tell them what to do. There's value in that. But working, interacting with the farmers individually, much smaller group of people, but I think you have a much bigger, potentially a much bigger impact. Um, 
the range of ecological knowledge among people is alarming and awe-inspiring. So it's just, it's been really fun where do you find people that know, you wouldn't expect it, and they go, oh yeah, you know, I know that, oh yeah, I know what this is. And then other places where you go, I have no idea. And you go, wait, wait, you don't have any idea? So it's, it's, it's always, that, that sort of a, a realization is always interesting. And ecological humility is a learned trait. Um, and this is one of the things, as people come up and want to do landscaping, you know, they have this vision of what they want to do with their land, and trying to convince them to take a year or two to understand where the land is at is sometimes, to have that humility is sometimes difficult. And it, the, the, again, this is just sort of a summary of how we view what we do, you know. We want to build compassion and stewardship for the land. Well, that's going to come if people love the land. And if you love something, you have curiosity about it. The curiosity, you ask questions, which leads to research. And you build knowledge. And the more you know about something, potentially the more you love it. So this is kind of how we view what we do as a, as a program. And the last, very, very last proposed study, and this is short, so don't worry. We're almost done. You're still following me, right? <laughs> Your dog. Um, this, these are maps that we did not do, but this is Scenic Hudson. Recently came out, this relates to the study we're thinking about, recently came out with what they call a food shed conservation study. So the, what they looked at is the, the farms that sell in New York City, where are they located? And in the Hudson Valley, this is where those farms are located. And so they prioritized areas based on where those farms are in terms of conservation. And the question is, okay, let's go the next step. This is production conservation. This is not nature conservation. So how do you take a map like that and then start to translate it into, okay, how can that farmland production conservation also have an important nature conservation component? So what role can Hudson Valley farming play in regional nature conservation? Given the diversity of landscapes in the valley, how can farming best support native species? What are the sub-region specific target ecological analogies? In other words, you know, this is up in here, for example, we have a lot of fens. Those are the calcareous wetlands. Farms play a role in preserving fens. But that may be irrelevant over here. There may be some other habitat that farms are playing a, a more important role in. So trying to understand the distribution of those target conservation communities is one aspect of what we want to try to do. Um, what role can nature play in supporting Hudson Valley, and far Valley farming? Okay, so that's going into what that other part of the talk I had. You know, what are the ser how can these natural areas also help provide services to the farms themselves? Um, you know, a big, and there's technical questions in there. How do we, how do we measure those services in a relevant way? And I, you know, I don't know the answer. This is part of what we're trying to work on. And it's in collaboration with some people here um, and some people at Scenic Hudson and some other places. So that is the end. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.